Thank you, <clears throat> Vice President Tanner, and thank you all for being here. I'm grateful also to be joined by my sweetheart, Jeannie. Uh, we will celebrate our 40th anniversary in just a couple of months. She's been a wonderful companion. We also have a number of our children and grandchildren here today. Uh, my family is the source of my greatest joy. They've also been a source of great humor from time to time. A few years ago on a joint family home evening with our children and grandchildren, my daughter Julie gave a lesson and then started making a few and then I started making a few concluding comments as grandpas often do. My little grandson Ethan, then age three, had had enough. And he shouted out, Just say amen, Grandpa. <laughs> he was quite young at the time, but he had learned that there was a direct correlation between when the speaker says amen and when they sit down and stop talking. Well, Ethan is here today, and I hope he will show a little more restraint as I speak. During the years I have taught at BYU, I have enjoyed hearing from a wide range of speakers on a great variety of topics. One story shared by Elder Dallin Oaks when he was president of BYU has stuck with me. Given from this very pulpit, the story went something like this. Many years ago, the federal government placed county agents throughout the country to help farmers learn to be more productive. One county agent in the South went to visit an old farmer in his area, but convincing the farmer to change proved to be rather difficult. He asked the farmer, wouldn't you like to know how to get more cow your cows to give more milk? Nope, the farmer replied. Well, wouldn't you like your pigs over there to grow faster and bigger? Again, the farmer answered, nope. Well, wouldn't you like to learn how to get more bushels of corn per acre? The same answer was given as before, nope. Exasperated, the county agent asked, well, why not? The farmer replied simply, I already knows more than I does. In other words, his knowledge was greater than his application of that knowledge, so why make matters even worse by obtaining even more knowledge? This story highlights two great challenges of mortality. First, the need to constantly increase our knowledge, and second, the need to continually improve our behavior to keep up with that greater knowledge. But there's also a third challenge the county agent might have uncovered if he had asked a second why question. Why don't you know, or why don't you do as much as you know? This question gets closer to the core of the problem, the farmer's level of love for his work or what he was in his heart. In addition to increasing what we know and improving how we apply that knowledge, we must refine who we are deep down in our heart. In a general conference address a few years ago, Elder Oaks stated, <clears throat> quote, in contrast to the institutes, institutions of the world which teach us to know something, the gospel of Jesus Christ challenges us to become something. As we move along the path of life, each of us, as members of the Church, must address these three areas of knowing, doing, and being. First, we must increase our level of knowledge, or what we know. In our search for truth, however, we have to be selective because we have an overwhelming amount of information available to us. It seems to me that information can be classified into four categories. In the first is that which is harmful and destructive. Much of today's media falls into this category. Pornography is especially dangerous, for it will drive away the spirit and destroy us. The second category includes information that isn't necessarily destructive but is not of much use. Pursuing it is largely a waste of time. <clears throat> The third category includes information that is good and useful and offers much practical benefit. Most of our university, falls into this, university learning falls into this category. The fourth category includes vital information, specifically gospel knowledge. The truthfulness and value of the information in this fourth category will be confirmed to us by the Holy Spirit. 
how important it is for us to shun the harmful, avoid wasting time on the useless, and instead focus on the useful and vital. That which gives eternal perspective helps develop wisdom and teaches us the mind and nature of God. The thirteenth article of faith says that we as Latter-day Saints seek after things that are virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy. And that's a good standard for us to keep in mind as we choose what to read, what to listen to, and what to view. Where do we find the vital information for our lives? <clears throat> Three major sources, I believe, are the temple, the church, that the church magazines, and the scriptures. In the temple, we come into the Lord's house, dedicated as a house of learning, where we are taught eternal truths through verbal, visual, and symbolic instruction, and where we may seek inspiration for specific personal concerns. President Hinckley has said, quote, Every temple, large or small, has its beautiful celestial room. It is our privilege, unique and exclusive, while dressed in white, to sit at the conclusion of our ordinance work in the beautiful celestial room and ponder, meditate, and silently pray. We all need to make the temple an important and frequent part of our learning. We also need the ensign and its messages of wisdom and inspiration to come into our homes and into our lives each month. Just as the early saints looked to their prophet, Brigham Young, to guide them along a literal path from the Midwest to the Rocky Mountains, so must we look to our prophets to guide us along a spiritual path. I hope each student department receives the ensign each month and is blessed by its influence. In addition to learning from the temple and the ensign, we need daily scripture study. Just as helium slowly escapes from an inflated balloon, allowing it to fall after a few days, so do we slowly lose the power and memory of the scriptures without daily reading. President Hinckley has said, quote, I hope that for you, studying the scriptures will become something far more enjoyable than a duty that, rather, it will become a love affair with the Word of God. I promise you that as you read, your minds will be enlightened and your spirits will be lifted." End of quote. In August of 2005, President Hinckley asked us all to reread the Book of Mormon by the end of that year. He promised us an added measure of the Spirit of the Lord, a strengthened resolution to walk in obedience to His commandments, and a stronger testimony of the living reality of the Son of God. Faithful saints from all over the world responded to his call. Regarding this challenge, a member of my BYU stake shared the following special experience with me. To the best of my recollection, he said, I was flying back from a trip to the Far East. It was the middle of the night and most of the passengers were asleep. I, however, had my reading light on and was reading the Book of Mormon so I could finish by the end of the year as the prophet had asked. Suddenly, I was interrupted by a flight attendant who was walking down the aisle. She whispered, Where are you? <laughs> I responded, I'm in Messiah. She replied, I'm in Ether. <laughs> then she said, turn around and look. I turned and looked toward the back of the plane and saw several other reading lights on. She whispered, all are reading the Book of Mormon. Although our lives are filled with countless demands and distractions, I think we all learn from our prophet that we can find the time to study the scriptures if we are determined enough, each in our own way and place and time. He has told us the what, individually, we work out the how. In addition to giving spiritual strength, the scriptures also contain counsel to help address life's practical challenges. Some years ago, I served as a branch president at the Missionary Training Center, and I often told the missionaries that the scriptures could help them solve all their missionary challenges. One Sunday in priesthood meeting, we listed on the chalkboard several typical missionary challenges. Then I assigned small groups of elders to look up scriptures to address each of those challenges. After a few minutes, I asked them to report on their findings. 
One group had tackled the problem of dealing with girlfriends back home. The verse they found to solve the problem came from John chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? <clears throat> Mine hour is not yet come. <clears throat> Building on the first area of increasing our knowing, we move on to the second area of improving our doing. For although increased knowledge is vital, it is not enough. The Apostle James states that we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. And just as reading and pondering the words of God is accompanied by the Spirit, so will the doing aspect of the gospel be accompanied by the Spirit. The Savior said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The Lord expects each step upward in knowledge to be followed by a step upward in performance. The Apostle James adds, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In other words, sin is the difference between our knowing and our doing. The greater the gap between the two, the greater the sin. And as the Doctrine and Covenants section 82 instructs, Of him unto whom much is given, much is required. And he who sins against the greater life, light shall receive the greater condemnation. Elder Maxwell highlights the tight linkage between knowing and doing as follows, quote, So it is that discipleship requires all of us to translate doctrines, covenants, ordinances, and teachings into improved personal behavior. Otherwise, we may be doctrinally rich but end up developmentally poor." End of quote. Why does our doing so often lag behind our knowing, whether with home teaching, family home evenings, or a wide range of other areas? I suppose that busy schedules, distractions, wrong priorities, lack of commitment, and just poor time management contribute to the problem. In a statement regarding attendance at the temple, President Heber J. Grant addressed the typical excuses we make. Quote, we can generally do that which we wish to do. A young man can find an immense amount of time to spend with his sweetheart. We can arrange our affairs to get exercise in the shape of golf and otherwise. We can arrange our affairs to have amusements. And if we make up our minds to do so, we can arrange our affairs to do temple work, judging from my own experience. I do not know of anyone that is busier than I am, and if I can do it, they can, if they will only get the spirit in their hearts and souls of wanting to do it. There is the key. Get the spirit in our hearts so we want to do it. Improvement in the doing arena does take great dedication. New habits can be hard to establish and old habits can be so hard to break. As my son Steve included his mission in England, my wife and daughter and I joined him to travel and to visit some of the people he had baptized or helped activate. One faithful sister talked of her growth in the church since her baptism. She spoke of the dedicated effort required to stay on the path and then said, It is so easy to backslide. It is indeed easy to backslide, but we can overcome it with enough, de with, with enough determination. One of the people I baptized on my mission in Canada showed incredible determination to break a cigarette habit. He and his family lived on a small farm northwest of Calgary, Alberta, and, and a few months after they were baptized, he was out in the barn moving some bales of hay. Under one of the bales, he discovered a partially smoked cigarette. Without thinking, he picked it up and ran toward the house to get a match so he could smoke it. But halfway there, he stopped, looked at the cigarette, and asked himself, Am I going to be in charge of my life? Or is this cigarette going to rule over me? After a crucial moment of intense internal battle, he dropped the cigarette to the ground and walked slowly back to the barn. Doctrine and Covenants 98 reveals, For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. I will prove you in all things whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death. 
Let me share two additional doing examples that highlight the importance of establishing and maintaining good spiritual habits. <clears throat> First, a member of my uh, BYU stake recently told me that at one time in her life she had been mistreated at church, and so she stayed away for a few weeks. Even after just a few weeks of absence, this wonderful returned missionary found it difficult to come back. Looking back on it now, she said, I realize how important it is to stick with good spiritual habits. The second example comes from my own family. Our daughter Amy married into a family that has had daily scripture study for over 20 years without a single miss. And Amy and her family have carried on that pattern for the seven years they have been married. Even when she is in the hospital with a new baby, their daily scripture study is carried on by telephone. How gratifying it is for Jeannie and me as parents to visit the homes of our other children as well and see a similar pattern of faith, faithfulness including our family's habit of weekly family home evenings, which now spans nearly 40 years. Just as gaining knowledge should expand from basic principles to deeper doctrine, so should our doing go beyond minimal compliance with specific thou shalt or thou shalt not commandments. The Lord says that it is not meet that I should command in all things. Men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. For the power is in them, wherein they are agents unto themselves. And just as there are harmful and useless materials that can occupy our reading and learning, so are there harmful and useless activities that can occupy our time. We should avoid filling our days with these activities and instead spend our time doing that which is useful and vital. As someone once stated, that which matters most must never be at the mercy of that which matters least. Giving service such as that which we give in our Church, in our communities, and especially in our families is central to this useful and essential work. By losing ourselves and doing good for others, we come to understand what the Lord meant when He said, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Moving from increasing our knowing and improving our doing, we now come to the third and most important part of our progress, purifying our being or refining who, we, who and what we are deep down in our hearts. Elder Iring clarifies that although doing is important, it is not our ultimate goal. In our last general conference, he said, The things we do are the means, not the end we seek. What we do allows the Atonement of Jesus Christ to change us into what we must be. Elder Bednar adds, People of integrity and honesty not only practice what they preach, they are what they preach. Elder Oaks tells us that the final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgment of the final effect of our acts and thoughts what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made into some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. And what is it that we must become? The Savior answers very simply, even as I am. He is the mark we must always look to. He is our supreme example, chosen, our sa chosen as our Savior not just because of His perfect obedience, but because of His perfect love, love which encompasses perfect knowledge and which motivates perfect obedience. The Savior also used the example of a child to teach us what we must become. Matthew records that Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Numerous verses of Scripture give additional detail as to the type of people we must become. From the thirteenth article of faith, we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous. From Alma, be humble.
be submissive and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering, being temperate in all things. From King Benjamin in the book of Mosiah, become as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things the Lord gives us. From Doctrine and Covenants 4, have faith, hope, charity, love, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. And finally, from the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, section 121, be long-suffering, gentle, meek, loving, and kind. That, to me, is an exciting list. Imagine yourself when all those Christ-like attributes are yours. Obviously, we are in, a, in for a lifetime of effort and then some. The prophet Joseph Smith stated that, quote, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you have passed through the veil before you will have learned them. It is not all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave." End quote. The Family Proclamation also highlights the long-term process of becoming like Christ when it says that we are here in mortality to obtain a physical body and gain earthly experience to progress toward perfection. Some of us become too self-critical in the process. We want patience and we want it now. Sooner or later, we have to learn that becoming patient includes learning patience with ourselves as well as with others. Things take time. And those who become overzealous often find that the gospel isn't much fun anymore. Because of their perfectionistic attitude, it becomes more stressful than satisfying. We can fall off both sides of the path, and we must strive to stay in the middle where we're making reasonable progress given our life's circumstances. The Lord told the prophet Joseph Smith, quote, Do not run faster or labor more than you have strength and means. That is good counsel. We all need to learn to do our very best and then to be at peace. The Lord knows our circumstances, which change from season to season in our lives, and He will accept what we humbly and sincerely offer as our best, even though it is less than perfect. Two specific Temple Recommend interview questions set a nice standard for us. They don't ask if we're perfect, but rather if we're striving to keep the commandments and if we consider ourselves to be worthy. Without becoming anxious and obsessive overachievers, we can strive to keep the commandments, and we can be worthy. Elder Maxwell reminds us that all of us are in the process of becoming, including prophets and general authorities. Because of differences in opportunity, talent, and circumstance, how we become Christ-like varies somewhat from person to person. But common elements in our spiritual progress include gospel study, service and activity in the Church, and obedience to the commandments. But above all, it is the cleansing effect of the Atonement and the Spirit that purify and change our hearts. As King Benjamin's people learned, it was the Spirit of the Lord that wrought a mighty change in them, that they had no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. The many trials and challenges of life also help us become more Christ-like. For some, for some people, life's trials seem to be relatively small. But even many little trials over a period of years can help us learn patience, meekness, and love if we will be humble and teachable students. In our last General Conference, President Hinckley, uh, now age 96, said, When a man grows old, he develops a softer touch, a kindlier manner. Someone once told me, it's not your fault if you're not beautiful by age 18, but it is your fault if you're not beautiful by age 80. One of the special older and beautiful people in my life was my mother. After my father passed away at almost 99 years of age, my mother, also in her 90s, lived with my family from time to time. 
through her sweet example. She taught us always to look on the bright side of life and to see the good in others. One day, Jeannie was telling her of one of our sons whose bedroom was a disaster, with clothes, school books, and other stuff strewn about on bed and floor. My mother listened patiently and then said lovingly, well, just tell him he has a clean ceiling. <laughs> this grandmother, with her pure and loving heart, was able to overlook the mess on the floor and look upward to the ceiling to find something to compliment. For some people, the trials of life can be much more challenging. A month ago, my son Steve and his wife Amy were saddened to learn that their little five-month-old daughter, their first child, has a 17th chromosome disorder that presents to her and to her parents a very uncertain future. Since then, the Primary Children's Medical Center in Salt Lake has become their home as the medical staff monitors little Brooklyn's rare problems. Remembering that Robbie Hammond, my teaching assistant from two years ago, has a daughter with a, an 18th chromosome problem. I wrote to Robbie and told him of Steve and Amy's situation. In his email reply regarding my granddaughter, this young father reveals the tenderness of his heart as he talks of his own daughter, Emily, now age two. Robbie wrote, it's always a difficult time when, we learn, when you learn something like that. But believe me when I tell you that there is so much joy that comes from situations like this. Camille and I have never been through anything as joyful or as painful at times as with Emily. But it's the painful times that make the joyful times so indescribable. For example, when Emily was born, we were told a fairly doom and gloom story about what Emily would be like as she grew up. If those doctors could only see Emily now. Her most recent trick is rolling onto her stomach and getting up on her knees and rocking back and forth. Because she is blind, she hasn't quite figured out that crawling can get her to where she wants to go. I mention this because of how, indes how incredible I feel when I see her learn to do something as simple as get on her hands and knees and rock back and forth. It's almost brought me to tears of joy sometimes just watching her progress. Please let your son uh, know that while there are certainly difficulties, the joys are unimaginable. Emily brings a very strong spiritual presence to my life." End of quote. Trials were certainly no stranger to the prophet Joseph Smith. While suffering in the Liberty Jail, he was told by the Lord that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. And at the end of his life, just before riding off to Carthage where he would meet his death, Sister Mary Ellen Kimball overheard him say to her neighbor, if I never see you again, or if I never come back, remember that I love you. Sister Kimball wrote that while the prophet's enemies had ripened in wickedness, he had ripened in goodness. That is also our challenge, to ripen in goodness, even in the midst of a world ripening in wickedness, to develop a Christ-like heart filled with love for God and for all mankind. Without a heart filled with love for what we do and for those whom we serve, none of us will ever fully achieve what we could or should. I pray that the Lord will bless us throughout our lives as we strive to progress in all the three areas of knowing, doing, and being. I pray that we will be diligent in doing our very best, but also be patient as we improve line upon line, learning upon learning, repentance upon repentance onward and upward, with the Lord trying us and proving us as we go. At times we'll learn first and then be tried later. At other times the Lord will try us first and then teach us from the trials. But in spite of the sequence, I pray that we will move forward with faith in and a love for the Lord, even while not knowing beforehand what lies ahead. Later in life, we'll be able to look back on the what of our lives and understand the why. If we have been true and faithful, these backward glances will reveal to us a clear path of progress toward perfection, guided by an all-wise, very patient, and loving Heavenly Father. I testify that He lives, that His Son Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, 
and that they know and love each one of us beyond our present capacity to comprehend. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.